like most of us. I'm, I'm super excited about today uh, for a couple of reasons. One, uh, we are very close now to winter solstice. That happens on the 21st. And I am delighted today to be welcoming Lauren Van Ham later on in our conversation together. And Lauren will spend some time reflecting as her role that she has as an eco chaplain, thinking about how do we, in, in a sense, weave our, I don't think it's even how we weave. I think it's how we acknowledge that we, our spiritual lives are woven uh, into the fabric of the natural world. And I wanna explore that uh, with you today and allow her to kind of share some of her reflections on why that is so important in her life and for us as a planet at this time, how we acknowledge the way in which our spiritual lives, our soul, our very flesh and blood literally is woven into the fabric of the created order and the cosmos and all that holds us and what that means for us as, as uh, folks. So um, that's, that's where we're headed today. As always, uh, do a shout out to each other as you arrive uh, on the scene today. If you're joining us live this morning, uh, feel free to say hello to each other and connect to each other, help create a kind of a sense of community together uh, as we journey into this ongoing relationship driven by a pandemic, right? <laughs> so that we're, we're spending time together like this, which is a good thing. It's, it's, um, you know, it's a, it's an awesome thing to know that every Sunday we get to get together like this. So make sure you say hi to each other. Uh, one particular shout out today before I get rolling is, um, um, you know, we have had a lot of celebrations. Uh, we call them festivals in our congregation that I'm a pastor at. And one of the people who have been a part of many of those festivals is a woman by the name of Carla. And Carla has joined us for our uh, celebration of Pride Sunday. Carla has joined us with the Dia de los Muertos. And Carla brings her just beautiful spirit to all those events. And Carla's birthday is on winter solstice. And so a happy birthday to Carla and, um, and I, we can only hope, Carla, that as we move into solstice and all the energy that that's going to bring this year, that it's a transformative year for you as you uh, move into another year of your life. So happy birthday. All right, I'll, uh, let, me, let me start by saying, you know, I don't know how many of you know this, but when I, in college, I was a religious studies major. And one of the things that I discovered in college pretty quickly as I kind of looked at religions from a, a, an objective kind of academic standpoint is it's a kind of a known entity that the, the religious impulse of the human spirit, if you look back over the trajectory of our evolution, that, that impulse began in relationship to the natural world with the awe and the wonder of the swirling stars above us, with a sense of how do we live in relationship to the growing seasons as agriculture begin to become a, um, a part of our collective life together. Over and over again, we see that cultures and peoples uh, throughout our long history on this planet, their spiritual lives have been birthed in relationship to the natural world and to the mystery and the wonder and the challenges that we face as we live within that natural order. And so spirituality in a sense is that's its birthing place. Of course, as we evolved as cultures, we began to construct abstract ideas of how we would language our spiritual lives or our sense of soul or spirit. And those became of course, uh, connected to time and place and we have religions that have uh, blossomed throughout uh, our history, a birth out of that kind of relationship as we matured as a culture. And so I think it's important to remember, particularly as we honor winter solstice and our connection to the cosmos, that there is still um, no reason why we need to jettison that core spiritual connection to the natural world even though we've developed these complex religious systems as cultures. And so 
I'm hoping today that Lauren, as she reflects, can help you think about ways in which um, you can embrace that connection. I will tell you that when I talk to people uh, who either participate in church or don't participate in church experiences, they will tell me that probably the most deepest spiritual relationships or moments they have are linked oftentimes to the natural world, whether it be backpacking or on the seashore or taking a long walk or uh, seeing a bird fly up in the sky and sort of connecting to that beauty. You know, all these moments with nature and the natural world are invitations to a, a real sense of spirituality and how powerful that can be for people. The other one that shows up oftentimes, just if you're wondering, is the spirituality of just uh, relationships, human relationships one to another, you know, the sense of the deep connection we have to one another. Uh, that too is a, a, um, a, uh, a fa the fabric or the foundation on which a lot of spiritual experiences are built as well. So today we want to explore the one that links us to the natural world. And in a moment, I'm going to invite Lauren to join me and have some questions. But before I do, I, I wanted to read one of the poems that we have read for winter solstice. This one's by Susie Cassim. Um, and I think it's a nice way to kind of sink into this experience of spirituality and the natural world. So just take a couple of deep breaths and listen to this poem as we get ready to have a conversation with Lauren this morning. And maybe feel your uh, body resting on the planet today, however you're situated. And as you breathe, feel yourself kind of sink into the embrace of mother earth and then let this poem wash through you. Everybody has a little bit of the sun and the moon in them. Everybody has a little bit of man, woman, and animal in them, darks and lights in them. Everyone is part of a connected cosmic system, part earth and sea, wind and fire, with some salt and dust swimming in them. We have a universe within ourselves that mimics the universe outside. Everybody has a little bit of sun and moon in them. Isn't that a beautiful piece of poetry. So welcome to this uh, conversation this morning. Let me bring um, Lauren into the conversation. She has some time to spend with us. Uh, she has, has another interview after ours. So she's got a busy morning ahead of her. So let me welcome uh, her to our conversation. And I have to hear her. So hold on a minute <laughs> as well. Oh, gosh. Hello, Lauren. Hello, Dan. <laughs> It's like uh, all in the family these days. It's so fun. I love I it. I know. <laughs> As everybody remembers, we got to uh, visit with uh, Lee Van Ham, uh, Lauren's dad, last week. It was great. And of course, did the podcast with Lee uh, this week. So that will be posting up on the 25th. And this morning, uh, we get to have a conversation with Lauren. So just so happy to have you, Lauren. Great to be with you. Hello, our Savior's Lutheran and community. Yeah, and you've been on site before, so you know who you're talking to. So it's that's an awesome thing. Well, Lauren, we are excited to have you um, today. I know we've got a little bit of time with you today, and um, one of the things that we wanted to explore with you, if we uh, in this conversation, particularly because we're getting ready for winter solstice, and many of us who uh, long to have a physical celebration are unable to do that because of COVID nineteen. In fact, just the other night, uh, Lori and I got together with just another couple and had our little mini solstice celebration on the labyrinth at church at night. So that was beautiful. Mm -hmm. But we also want to just let people have a way to kind of enter into their, the way in which they feel their kind of soul's interconnectivity with the natural world. And to kind of hear from you, from the perspective you bring as, a, as an eco-chaplain, to how people might... Um, understand that more deeply, maybe experience it more deeply, how it sort of affects your 
spiritual trajectory and kind of where you're at today as you continue to kind of um, allow that to inform your soul's journey. So those are the conversation. That's a conversation I hope to have with you today. So let's great. Let, let's see where it goes, shall we? Dive in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we could talk because we haven't talked in a long time, but we could save that for another time. Um, uh, let me start by asking a question. You know, in 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 so many religious practices, we often kind of start obviously by thinking about the natural world from the starting place of our own spiritual or religious tradition. And then we look at the stories in that religious tradition, uh, the story of creation or Noah and the flood or the way in which Jesus parables kind of guide us into a, a relationship with earth and seasons and growth and all the beauty that's there. So oftentimes we start kind of from a religious framework and then we apply that religious framework to the natural world. And it feels like you have another way of also kind of exploring spirituality that moves the other direction that pays more attention to the natural world and then lets it give shape to our spiritual life as if it's kind of moving, the momentum is shifting the other way. It's like gift from planet to us. Mm. How, how can you kind of unpack that for mm. us as someone who serves as an eco chaplain and um, help us to kind of wrap our heart and soul around that energy that moves in that direction? Great. I believe that we really stand in solidarity with Jesus or Lao Tzu or Muhammad when we do approach it in the way that you're suggesting it, Dan, because I mm. think I think all of those guys are eco chaplains. I think that they, like us, were walking on earth and trying to make sense of existence. And um, certainly there was an understanding that there was mystery. There was something much larger than us that we might call God. Um, but it was the, the, what was tangible around us and what was so vast before us mm. that um, became our best metaphor for making sense of it. And um, yeah, so I, I, I think in, in a lot of ways, it was these eco chaplains who, um, these first eco chaplains who led us into this experience. And then, you know, humans being humans and a little anthropocentric, yeah. um, <laughs> we wrote these sacred texts and we documented things. And it's great that we did. It's, it's, it's just that sometimes those sacred texts end up getting us there in sort of a backwards route um, because the sacred text is also um, as soon as we walk out our front door. Yeah. So I, I'm hearing you say that we, in a sense, because we are a bit anthropocentric, we ended up writing ourselves or our projection of ourselves maybe into the dynamism of spirituality that we, um, that maybe was inspired by this relationship with the natural world, but, but maybe that was a little too heavy handed or how would you, uh, how would you describe that? To yeah, people? that's interesting. I mean, I think, um, you know, again, I think we're, I think we're always doing the best we can with what we've got. Mm -hmm. And um, the metaphors and the symbols in all of these stories. Um, I mean, Noah and the Great Flood is such an important story for any of us who are currently living this extractive, exploitive, polluting life on planet Earth. Mm -hmm. um, the, the Earth is saying, stop, slow down, or like, the biodiversity is going to be lost. Yeah, yeah. So when I think when humans see ourselves in that story, we we document it and we say, hey, like, take heed, let's not ever do this again. Mm -hmm. So you, I, I'm hearing you say that we, uh, in, in some ways, our, our relationship with the planet becomes or is sort of that primary experience. And then as we live into that experience and being kind of cultured, people who can find language and metaphor and images to begin to describe that, that is a kind of, um, it's almost like a, um, a dance we have as thinking beings with this kind of primary connection to the, the sacred world we think of as the earth or the cosmos. That's it's what I'm hearing you so say. so well said. Yeah. That's so well said because, you know, 
I don't know what it's like to be in the mind of a hippo or the mind of a tree. Right. They might be doing some version of this too, but, but this is the <laughs> I, way I that like we that. cogitate, you know, yeah. this is the way that we're doing it. And, and it can be a bit problematic as we all know, um, yep. but some really good things have come out of it too. Right. I love that idea. I hadn't thought about that till you just said it. Like what is the spirituality of the hummingbirds or the eagle or the tree or the plant? I hadn't, you know, to, to wonder that they too have some sort of, you know, intimate bond with their uh, ecosystem that probably manifests itself in their own spirituality. I just hadn't thought about that. And how, you know, how can they not? It is the invitation for us to, to ponder that, to be yeah. that. I wonder, I remember, um, I know this is a little bit off track, but I remember one of the Buddha's final sermons was uh, no words, but simply a handing of a, a flower, as I recall, to a, one of his disciples. And, um, you know, I wonder if there was more deep truth in that, like, it's all there, there, <laughs> you know, you don't have, you can use language, but you don't need language to be able to have this kind of intimate awareness of the kind of spirit conversation that's happening all the time, everywhere, in all beings, that sort of thing. Yeah, I think, um, <laughs> I mean, that's it. It's I, I like, I want to, this is what I found on my walk today. Um, yes. Talk about that. It just, well, you know, um, this, this sweet green with these baby pine cones was um, destitute on the sidewalk. Mm. And I, I just thought I have greens at home that you can come and be family with instead of just dying here alone on the sidewalk by yourself. Um, but oh, but, so but awesome. this, this is just, this is it, right? Yeah. I'm, um, I think for the Buddha to be sitting in front of a throng of people and to have the opportunity to say all kinds of things and instead to hold up a flower mm -hmm. and let the flower speak, um, we we would be wise to take heed. Yeah. Well, you, you just gave that sermon yourself. So thanks for that. How, um, so given that framing, now let's move into kind of the idea of solstice, which for me has so much energy in it. I, and I think obviously, cause it's linked to this time of year where Christmas for Christians comes in where, you know, we're, we're waiting for what we have called the light of the world to be born. You know, we have this whole light imagery around Christmas time. I've got all my Christmas lights up okay. and it, Christmas lights in the evergreen. I mean, we have that kind of notion. And here we are entering into solstice, the longest of the nights. That is this breaking point, you know, of the deepest, darkest beauty of night. And then that slow, slow journey into springtime. How, how do you, um, find meaning in this celebration of solstice particularly as it kind of gives shape to your spiritual perspective or your religious insights or your soul's journey well how do you link those two together yeah um so what's so stirring to me about the winter solstice is i think about the earliest humans who didn't have any science didn't have documentation um and for a period of time i mean they're keen observers right they they're mm -hmm. they live so close to the earth and they they see that the sun is shining for fewer minutes <laughs> every day yeah uh wow and is like is there going to be a point where it just doesn't come back right <laughs> yeah um because we need it right i mean this is our light this is our warmth um and so through this, this keen observation, I can imagine this sense of foreboding and no wonder they were praying, they were dancing, they were doing all they can to petition and say, please don't go, please, please come back. And so, okay, over time, um, of course, they start to realize that the sun does come back and the days start to get longer. Thank goodness. Right, um, exactly. Um, but those, those rituals stayed, it became, it became clear that there was something about taking our souls through this process of, 
of really being in relationship with the dark, of, of coming to grok it and appreciate it and to see what's there for us so that we can, at least in the Northern Hemisphere, at the end of the year, release the patterns that are no longer serving to put these stories that aren't helpful into the compost bin and to welcome the return of the light. There's, there's mm. nothing to be afraid of in the dark. The dark is our teacher, but this time of year really allows us to be in it. And, I, and there's just so much wisdom there. Yeah, I love that. I, I love too that the, you know, for me, the, the solstice also reminds me of that. The, it, it's like a trigger point to remind me that the seasons, you know, that the, the planetary system that holds us provides for us these seasons that, like you said, are cycles, right? That I can trust in them. And then I, it gives me some freedom to, like what you said, kind of allow myself to let things go because I, I know I've learned and I celebrate as well, right? That springtime is on the way and that this pattern is gonna keep, this life pattern is gonna have, happen. And then, and then that the entire planet is in resonance with these seasons, right? the trees lose their leaves and the plants wilt and stuff goes underground. And I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, everything that holds me is in this same relationship to these mm. seasonal patterns. Mm. And how can I not, how can I not, as uh, Drew Dellinger says in one of his poems, how can I not but dance, you know, in that relationship and sing and, and love and, you know, feel the energy of life. How can I not but dance in that pattern? It's just so unbelievable. Beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Um, how how do you think, I don't remember why, I don't know that I've ever even asked you this uh, of all the years I've known you, but when you shifted to being, you know, a classic reverend to being an eco chaplain, you know, what, what changed in the trajectory of your own spirituality, if you can remember back that, that you think is beneficial to you when you kind of added that, no, I'm not added because you've given yourself to that awareness. Can you remember back on like, what were some of the early things that showed up for you as you did that? If people are interested in kind of incorporating more of that into their own spiritual practice or awareness, what might be there for them that they don't even know exists yet. Do you have any insight or can you remember what were some of those kind of, um, experiences that came on board when you made that shift from just classic clergy yeah. person to eco chaplain? Yeah, I think that's great. Um, I think I was always an eco chaplain. Oh. Um, <laughs> <We're all that. laughs> I think, um, you know, I mean, since being a kid on my grandparents' farm or um, camping with my family in the summers in Rocky Mountain National Park, I, there, there were mentors along the way who um, made it very clear to me that when I was in church with the stained glass windows or when I was in the mountains, it was sort of same, same. Mm. Um, so that, that shift that you're talking about, it right. was sort of, it was kind of a coming out experience. It was ah, sort of like, so it was already I don't need inside to, of you. I don't, yeah, like I don't need to compartmentalize these things anymore. And maybe, oh, that's good. Maybe that's the invitation, you know, yeah. for everyone is, is to, to sort of um, just free your, your inner eco chaplain, allow them to, to come out and express themselves how, how they wish to. Yeah. That you stumbled into that without knowing. Uh, <laughs> I, I, th I think you're right. It is. What did you say? This, you didn't. You didn't have to silo those two yeah, experiences. Yeah, I didn't have to compartmentalize. That's right? it. Yeah, you could add them together. You could be both a Buddha with parable and a Buddha with flower in hand at the same time. Uh, Just like they were, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's very free. That's totally liberating, in my opinion. Um, I think on two different fronts. One is that given the state of the environment right now, if, if we can't reclaim or maybe add to the experience of nature, that sort of capacity for it being a spiritual experience, then how will we have the heart to make the hard changes that are required to get back in line with the natural world more fully, right? I, I do think 
now is the time to sort of um, to integrate the two without feeling like you're going to lose one or the other. I wonder if people fear that they're going to turn into kind of a Wiccan priestess if they do that. And then, you know, there, there goes my Sunday morning experience. Um, that hasn't been the case for you. No, it, ha it hasn't. And I think that there's, I think you're right, that there's a lot of anxiety around that, that mm -hmm. um, we, we can get so uh, kind of polarized and dualistic. Um, <clears throat> we're Westerners, we sort of do that. Mm. Um, but if we can, the metaphor I always use is, can I let the peas touch the carrots? You know, <laughs> like, can I just let things get a little bit messy? Um, because probably things are going to be all right. It might even taste good. Who knows? You know, <laughs> talk about boiling it down to the simplest imagery possible. <laughs> peas and carrots, peas and carrots, peas and carrots, peas and carrots. I don't have to be, I don't have to polar, be polarized about everything uh, on my plate. Um, <laughs> That one's going to stick with me, Lauren. I, I like that one. <laughs> um, all right, one more. I don't know how much time. Let me see. Let me look at the time. I can hardly. Yes, we're a little bit. We got a little bit more time. We're fine. Yeah. Oh, geez, you're so easy. Um, talk to me a little bit about. So, if if you are bringing those two traditions together, and let's just call them traditions, right? So the tradition, our long, long evolutionary tradition of being in a spiritual relationship with the planet and our uh, culturally constructed uh, images and metaphors that we now call our religious experience, you know, our traditional religious experiences. If, if we were to allow both to be on the plate together, peas and carrots, peas and carrots, peas and carrots, um, <laughs> I do think you're getting some insight into how my mind works here. So <laughs> if we're able to do that, um, let me get to the point here. Oh yeah, C could you think about some of the kind of classic ways in which we articulate our spirituality through our traditional religious frames like forgiveness or redemption or, or um, reconciliation or communion. Yeah. And can, can you, or are, are there ways in which you can see those playing out in, in the relationship with the natural world? So, yeah. you know, so rather than always think about carrying all of the spiritual insights from our relationship to the spiritual to the natural world into our religion are there kind of things that we have thought about in in abstract that could go back into uh our experience with nature does that make sense that it question makes so much sense and i think um what i what i want to underscore is that in light of what you said a few minutes ago we have to do that dan mm. we this, this moment is so important for humans to start to do what you just said. And I, I want to kind of give two examples. Yeah, that'd be um, great. In my spiritual direction practice, I'm seeing um, clients, you know, usually one-on-one. -on -one, and sometimes they're presenting um, a difficult decision. Um, sometimes they're showing up with a ton of grief about something they've lost. And... Um, in those situations, kind of the, the logos mind doesn't always come up with the best medicine. You know, sometimes mm. we sort of sit there um, without words and a little puzzled. And <clears throat> I think one of our best resources in that moment is to think about the living system. Mm. So that when I'm puzzling over this decision, or I'm hanging out with um, huge despair, where in the living system is this reflected back to me? Where in, in the ecology do I see this? And almost always, there's an example. <laughs> A little bit like you saying, wow, I'm, I'm realizing that the trees are experiencing the winter solstice the same way I am. And I have, I have community here. So I think that that's really important. I think that that's, um, in, instead of humans, again, anthropocentrically, kind of moving our way through it and trying to grok it, what if we allowed the living system to teach us how to be with our depression, to show us how to make a difficult decision? Mm. Um, almost always, there's a teaching in nature. And do you find, and before you move to that, because you had two examples, do you find that the client, so to speak, what is the experience that the client then engages in? Is it is there some sort of 
methodology to allowing for that, that you invite them into? Um, yeah, I mean, if we're outside, which sometimes I'm seeing clients outside, especially now in yeah, right. COVID times, yeah. um, sometimes we can find something just looking around us. Hmm. Um, often there's relief. There's, you know, there's an epiphany, there's new energy and kind of saying, oh, right. You know, that that's my dog actually taught me that. Or there's this oh. tree and I'm going to go, I'm going to go grieve and be with this tree. I'm going to give this yeah. to the tree. So whatever sort of ritual might come out of um, the moment, sometimes there's levity, sometimes there's catharsis, yeah. um, but there's a place to put it. There's a place to be with it. It's interesting to listen to you talk. I was, we, you know, we interviewed um, Amber, the fire dancer from Winter Solstice in our podcast series a couple a week ago. And she, she was talking about how she allows her body to kind of connect to the natural world. And she made, she had this line, I think she goes, your body will know. It, it's like you turn to the natural world, whether you're looking for a place that invites you into deep relationship or that matches maybe something that you're working through, your your body will feel where that connecting place is, like the, what you were describing. And I, I'm not sure that many of us have experience with that, but people who I've talked to who do that as a practice, they clearly get it, <laughs> you know, that your your body can know this other body that holds you in an intimate way. So just trust it. Um, pretty powerful. So wise. Yeah. So what was wise. you had another example. Did you? Have well, another example? I mean, that's a good segue into my next example. I was I was thinking awesome. about communion actually. Yeah. Yes. Um, so when I was a hospital chaplain, I was working in a Catholic hospital there were patients and nurses who um, just didn't feel like their day was complete if they hadn't received Eucharist. It was a daily ritual. It was mm. so important. And um, communion requires us to, before we receive the Eucharist, kind of empty ourselves a bit to reflect, mm. maybe to think about where we missed the mark this week, where did I drop the ball yesterday, um, how can I humble myself and um, be, be with spirit and get filled up and go back out there and try again to, yeah. to do my best? What if, <laughs> what if when we walked into our backyard or locked the car in the parking lot to head into Muir Woods, what if we said to creation, I know I've really destroyed you in a lot of ways with the way that I live on this planet, but I'm, I'm coming into your creation today to really respectfully listen to whatever it is that you wanna show me. I just wanna be attentive. I guarantee the Eucharist will be so complete. <laughs> Mm. I guarantee the birds will sound different, that the trees will look different, that you will notice a bee or a fox that you might not have seen otherwise. This, I think, is the kind of um, humility and, and promise that is being offered to us if we understand that our relationship with nature is sacramental. Mm. Wow, I get it. That one's good. But everything you said is good. But that's pretty rich. You, when I heard you talking, I was, you know, we had Drew Dellinger as well share some of his poetry, and he had a line in one of his poems. He was talking about the cosmos, and the two terms came up inside his poetry about the natural world. This is my body, mm. and this is my blood, and I. I was like, what is he doing with that? And it's exactly what you're talking about. Um, this sort of invitation to see that level of communion inside our relationship with the natural world is buried inside of one of his pieces of poetry, uh, which was just absolutely spectacular. Um, I could hear his poem as you described mm -hmm. what you were describing. I think that's what you're, that's what you're inviting us into, uh, which is beautiful. It doesn't have to be difficult, right? No, yeah, right. 
but to think in terms of, I mean, you use, you use the term a sacramental relationship. And I maybe, can you say a little bit more about that? Because I, I think I know what you mean, but if someone were to go, what, what, do, you, what do you mean exactly by that? <laughs> Could you unpack that a little bit more? Sure. Um, I mean, when I, when I use the word sacramental, I'm, I'm thinking about sacred. I'm thinking about kind of these thresholds, the sacrament of marriage, the sacrament of baptism. These are these, mm -hmm. these thresholds. Um, like sacred we, thresholds. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and so um, instead of, you know, just, just as easily as, as um, communi communion in church could become kind of rote um, and just a pattern that, and now we do this thing. Mm -hmm. um, the same thing can be true when we're walking around the neighborhood, but it doesn't have to be. Mm -hmm. If I'm if I'm willing to um, just empty myself out a little bit first and tune in and ask permission in the way that I might before the liturgy in worship, um, I guarantee you that that walk around the block is going to have a different meaning than it would have otherwise. Yeah. Yeah, that's really helpful. Well, Lauren, I think uh, I, that's a beautiful place to kind of end this conversation because I, I wanted to move that whole trajectory of sort of what is an eco-chaplain to how does how do we all embrace our own inner eco-chaplain, which mm -hmm. I think you've taken us on that lovely journey this morning, and I totally appreciate that. And it's also just a great experience to have you in conversation with all of us during this time of celebration of solstice. So for people to um, kind of take it a little bit more seriously during this moment, since it's filled with its own natural kind of energy, this is a beautiful moment to pay attention to that sort of thing. Give it a try, wander outside uh, on the night of solstice on the 21st and see where that might become for you a sacramental moment or a sacred moment is just awesome. All right, Lauren, uh, just, just I'm gonna let you go, but I'm gonna finish up our conversation together with folks by reading some of Drew's uh, poetry. Oh, good. Yeah, and uh, just not a lot of it, but just enough to give them a taste. Um, he obviously does such a great job, I think. Uh, and I believe you know him quite well too. I mean, I he do. just does such a yeah. great job blending yeah. poetics, justice, environment, cosmology in a mashup that feels like the song of the universe, right? And it, he just he just does it so well. Yes, so. he's a treasure. Yeah, yeah. Um, thank you all so much, Dan and community, for letting me be with you in this very auspicious time of year. And uh, blessings on your solstice. You know, it's only going to be more potent tomorrow because of this Jupiter Saturn yes, thing I that's know. happening. I've been hearing so of that. Yeah, there will be a North Star for all of us to walk toward with our gifts. And um, I, I do, I encourage you to get out there tomorrow night and um, be in the dark. Mm. Yeah, thank you, all Lauren. Right. Blessings all, right. all, thanks so Take much. Take care, bye-bye. Bye. Whew, well, like I wanna breathe for a couple of minutes after that conversation. Um, you know, I've known Lauren for a while now and. I have such deep respect for her. And I remember the first time I had a conversation with her, I was, it was like someone lifted a veil. You know, I'm like, whoa, what, what are you, what are you doing? <laughs> and uh, it was some of my early experiences of trying to acknowledge and fully, uh, not fully integrate, because I don't know that I've fully integrated, but at least begin the integration process of how do I tend to the natural world and to my own religious tradition and to what, you know, how they play together and honoring them both. I, I, she was really kind of the, the genesis of a lot of that for me. Um, and I think you can see in hearing her this morning uh, why that is, what, what great wisdom she brings. Um, to close out our uh, time together, I wanted to uh, do two things. One is to uh, read a piece of poetry. This isn't the whole piece of poetry, but it's the introduction to the poem called Solstice that Drew Dellinger read and reflected on during our podcast that we had. And two things in the announcement time, I'm going to encourage you to listen to that podcast. 
uh, because it's just such a beautiful coming together of three people reflecting on what solstice means to them and how they have done what Lauren is talking about, right? Thinking about the relationship with earth and planet and stars and nature and tree and bird and plant and, and each other and, and living into the reality of that the best they can without constructing sort of the, this sort of rigorous a boundary line between how they understand sacred and how they understand secular. It just becomes one big conversation. Uh, Drew puts it beautifully in his poem called Solstice, which he spells S-O-U-L, stis, rather than S-O-L for sun. What does it mean to have a solstice, for our soul to pause for a moment, like it feels like the sun pauses for a moment on winter solstice before we begin the long journey into winter sleep on our way to the gift of springtime year after year after year. And how do we do that with the planet and the cosmos itself? So just a few lines from solstice. Every ounce of matter is frozen light. Roses, clouds, bones, tears, all slowly moving light. Everything is shining in glory, everything singing a story. And if love is a language, then I'm just learning to spell. While there's a story that the stars have been burning to tell. Isn't that beautiful? A great piece of poetry. Um, I would encourage you maybe even to get the book called A Love Letter to the Milky Way, a book of poems by Drew Dillinger. I can put a link to that in our uh, feed as well. Just a lovely way to have by your bedside or uh, while you have your cup of coffee uh, to allow poetry to guide you into the relationship um, with the earth as well as the earth inviting you into that relationship as well. So this morning, I want to um, uh, finish up by inviting you to kind of ruminate on all the conversation we've had so far and to, I'm hoping this week, uh, to allow Martin Morley, who uh, plays and brings a piece of music for us today, uh, to let that music and just your reflections dance together for a few minutes as you think about um, the power of solstice this call to acknowledge our relationship to the planet and to the cosmos um, and the gift of our own religious tradition, how it plays in there as well. So um, I'm gonna invite you to enjoy this piece by Martin this morning. Green Sleeves is a beautiful 16th century tune that some speculate may have been written by King Henry VIII himself. Probably not. At any rate, these days, when you hear it at Renaissance fairs, it is heard with the original lyrics, which are written from the perspective of a spurned lover. When we sing it at Christmas, though, we sing it with words that were written in the 19th century what child is this? Now, this tune is in 3-4 time, but it's not usually thought of as a waltz, unless you listen to this arrangement by Mark Hayes, in which he reimagines what child is this as a jazz waltz.
Wow, thank you, Martin. That was awesome. Uh, what a great piece that Martin brought us today. Um, just super to have him sharing that today. I was thinking as he was playing that today, um, kind of how it stands as a metaphor for what we've been talking about, right? This idea of being able to uh, take something traditional like our religious tradition and then improvise on it so that it becomes a jazz piece that moves with music that um, has a different kind of energy or rhythm to it. And yet it holds the essence of the original piece as well, right? How do we do that? Uh, keys and peas and carrots. <laughs> Bees and carrots. All right, I'll just a couple of announcements before I close with, uh, I'm gonna read that piece by uh, Dillinger one more time, but a couple of announcements. One, uh, a deep encouragement to you to try uh, tending to the um, podcast series, Soul Forum. We just launched season uh, series two, episode one, two, and then there's gonna be a third one too that are trying to focus in on this theme of how we integrate the natural world into our understanding and our experience that we sometimes just traditionally call our religious experience. So you'll hear from um, Laura Zucker, uh, Amber Tam, Tang, and uh, Drew Dillinger as they reflect on winter solstice. And then we put a small piece together that you could use on the night of the solstice it's like a, like a 12 minute piece that you could actually light a candle, go outside with your earbuds in, listen to the reflections and then also pay attention to nature itself. But those are available for you on Soul Forum. That link is also in the Facebook feed, but it's also on our website and anywhere that you listen to podcasts, just look for Soul Forum and you can have it as one of your favorites. So there's that. This week uh, is obviously Christmas week. And so a couple of, uh, opportunities for you. One is that we are going to post up on our YouTube channel, a children's piece for working the uh, manger scene. So that's in the playlist for kids. In addition, Martin and I will host a Christmas Eve service on YouTube that you can listen to anytime during Christmas Eve. And it'll integrate Martin's music, some of my reflections, some of my um, binge watching that I've been doing on Netflix. <laughs> and a little bit more of Martin's music, all to kind of pay attention to how do we find our way in a manger these days. Uh, so that will be available to you uh, coming up early in the week. And then finally at 345 on Christmas Eve is our attempt at a kind of a drive-in experience with uh, the ability to sing some carols and reflect on the story while you're sitting in your car uh, you'll be able to sing, you'll be able to um, interact with the story with some stuff that I ask you to do in your car. Uh, that's all happening at 345 on Christmas Eve. And we hope the kind of combination of all those experiences, despite having to have this Christmas holiday in relationship to a pandemic, uh, brings you a little bit of uh, uh, wisdom and beauty and holiday joy as well. All right. So thanks for being a part of our time together this morning. Let me finish off one more time with just that first part of this uh, poem called Solstice, which is a beautiful piece of poetry read in full during the podcast. But I think this introductory piece really sets the tone. Solstice. Every ounce of matter is frozen light. Roses, clouds, bones, Tears all slowly moving light. Everything is shining in glory. Everything singing a story. And if love is a language, then I'm just learning how to spell. While there's a story that the stars have been burning to tell. Have a beautiful week together together with family, friends, your own inner soul's journey, and the embrace of the cosmic spirit that holds us all. Solstice blessings. See you next week.